Hi, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. By now you all know me, but if not, my name's Mario. This video is part of my study series on studying for the ACRP CCRA exam or the Certified Clinical Research Associate exam. In this video, I'm gonna talk about section four on investigators, and this is gonna be in two parts. So this video is gonna cover section 4.1 to 4.6, and then my subsequent video will cover the rest of section four. So stay tuned for that second video, but right now we're gonna talk about 4.1 to 4.6 on investigators. Um, and this is one of the more critical sections. So make sure you know everything in this section, section four, and then my subsequent videos on section five, uh, that's gonna be where a lot of questions come from. So these two sections you need to know in and out. All right, so before I get started, I need to remind you as always to take a moment and smash that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Uh, more than 80% of you have not subscribed to this channel. So in an effort to boost subscriptions worldwide, I've decided I'm going to start sharing the uh, top countries where my videos have been watched in the last 90 days. So uh, I have my list here. So if you're curious, these are the places uh, in the last 90 days where my video was watched the most. So not too surprisingly, number one is the United States, uh, followed by the United Kingdom, followed by India, Canada, South Africa, Vietnam, Turkey, Germany, and Serbia. So I would love to grow this channel and continue to grow it and be a great resource to all of you, but I do need you guys to help me by subscribing and smashing that like button. All right, without further ado, let us jump into the investigator. And let's talk about section 4.1, investigator qualifications and agreements. Um, this section is pretty intuitive. So uh, I'll go over it relatively quickly. And the regulations say that the investigator should be qualified by education, training, and experience to re assume responsibility for the proper conduct of the trial. Uh, that makes sense. You want a qualified person that's trained and has experience uh, to be running a trial. Um, and they should meet all the qualifications specified by the applicable regulatory authorities and provide evidence through an up-to-date curriculum vita or CV. So this is where most sponsors interpret this to say that we should get an updated uh, signed and dated CV every two years. The regulations don't actually specify a time frame, but they do require an up-to-date CV. Um, the next part talks about the investigator being thoroughly familiar with the appropriate use of the investigational product, which is obviously important. Uh, and then the investigator should be aware of and comply with GCP and regulatory requirements. Uh, they should permit monitoring and, uh, and auditing by the sponsor and regulatory agencies or authorities. And the investigator should maintain a list of uh, appropriately qualified persons to whom the investigator has delegated significant trial related duties. So this is where delegation logs come into play and make sure that the investigator is maintaining a list and clearly showing what's delegated to whom. So. I think this section is, is pretty intuitive and most of the questions that are gonna come from this section should be fairly um, easy. You, need, you know you need someone that's qualified, trained, has experience, you know they need to comply with GCP um, and re any regulatory requirements, they need to permit uh, monitoring and auditing and they need to um, maintain a list of who's delegated to do what. So. Uh, jumping into the next section is adequate resources, and this is pretty much what the title makes it sound like. They, the sites and investigators are responsible for making sure that they have adequate resources, and this is in a few things. For example, for recruitment. So the regulation says the investigator should be able to demonstrate a potential for recruiting the required number of suitable subjects within the agreed upon recruitment period. So uh, that is within the regulations. Investigators need to show that they are able to uh, adequately recruit subjects. So the investigator should have sufficient time to properly conduct and complete the trial within the agreed trial period. The investigator should be available, uh, should, sorry, should have an adequate, uh, should have available an adequate number of qualified staff uh, and adequate facilities for the foreseen duration of the trial to conduct the trial properly. And the investigator should ensure that all persons assisting with trial are adequately informed about the protocol, the investigational product, and trial-related duties and functions. And this is where training comes in, uh, documentation of training for all the staff to show that they're adequately trained to work on this protocol. So I, I think this section's um, fairly intuitive. You resources, 
and everyone is, uh, you have all adequate resources and everyone is, is trained appropriately. All right, jumping into the next section, which is medical care of trial subjects. And you want people that are medically qualified and you need subjects to be aware that they are voluntarily in the trial and that they have the rights to withdraw. So uh, I'll, I'll go through the section uh, here. So a qualified physician who is an investigator or a sub-investigator for the trial should be responsible for all trial-related medical decisions. That makes sense. You want medical decisions being made by medically qualified individuals. So uh, that is what the regulations state. During and following a subject's participation in a trial, the investigator and institution should ensure that adequate medical care is provided to a subject for any adverse events, including clinically significant laboratory values related to the trial. So we wanna make sure that uh, people are adequately treated. And then uh, the final section in this part talks about making sure that subjects uh, are aware that they have the right to withdraw. Although a subject is not obliged to give his or her, or her, her reasons for withdrawing prematurely from the trial, the investigator uh, should make a reasonable effort to ascertain the reasons while fully respecting the subject's rights. So that's the section and uh, medically trained individuals, um, making sure that subjects are treated for any adverse events and um, making sure that they are aware that they are able to withdraw if they so wish. And the investigators are responsible if the subject withdraws to try to ascertain the reason, but it's not required. All right. so. Jumping into the next section, which is section 4.4, it's on communications with the IRB IEC. So before initiating a trial, the, investiga uh, the investigator slash institution should have written and dated approval, favorable opinion from the IRB slash IEC for the trial protocol, written informed consent, consent form updates, subject recruitment procedures, and any other written information to be provided to subjects. Now, um, this is really important to know you need to make sure you have all these things in place before initiating the trial. So it needs to go through uh, an IRB and you need to have an approval from an IRB. So uh, I could see this question being asked in some form where they wanna move forward with unapproved documents and just be a lookout for that in the verbiage of the question and see at what point they are starting. So just that is a potential question on the exam. So be aware of that. So as part of the investigator's institution's written uh, application to the IRB, the investigator slash institution should provide the IRB slash IEC with a written, sorry, with a current copy of the investigator brochure. So uh, they, if there's an investigator brochure available, pr provide it along with the protocol and all the other documents. Um, and then the next section is section 4.5, and this is compliance with protocol. So the investigator slash institution should conduct the trial in compliance with the protocol agreed to by the sponsor and if required by the regulatory authorities and which was given fair, uh, approval slash favorable opinion by the IRB slash IEC, the investigator slash institution and the sponsor should sign the protocol uh, to confirm agreement. So just know protocol signature pages. This is where they come from in the regulations. It says that the investigator is responsible to sign the protocol to show that they confirm agreement uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the protocol. So the investigator should not implement any deviation from or changes of the protocol without agreement by the sponsor and prior review and documented approval slash favorable opinion from the IRB slash IEC of an amendment, except where necessary to eliminate an immediate hazard to trial subjects, or when the changes involve only logistical or administrative aspects of the trial. So this is really, really, really important to know. When is a deviation approved by regulations? When is it okay to deviate? And the time that is okay to deviate is to eliminate an immediate hazard uh, from, to, to trial subjects. That is uh, pretty explicit in the regulations. That is a time where it is okay. So uh, obviously subject safety is paramount to everything, including following the protocol. So if there is something that's a safety issue, uh, the investigator is okay to deviate. Um, and then it talks here about uh, also the, um, if there were 
logistical or administrative uh, changes, such as change in monitors, change of telephone number. Uh, so those are uh, minor things uh, to note here. So I'm just going to read this again because this is integral to understand. The investigator should not implement any deviation from our changes of the protocol without agreement by the sponsor and re prior review and documented approval slash favorable opinion from the IRB IEC of an amendment, except where necessary to eliminate an immediate hazard to trial subjects or when the changes involve only logistical or administrative aspects of the trial. So if it's uh, immediate hazard or if it's logistical or administrative, uh, you don't need to worry about the um, uh, having a favorable IRB IEC uh, approval before uh, going forward. So uh, I think I've covered that uh, ad nauseum. So going to the next part, it says the investigator or person designated by the investigator to document and explain any deviation from the approved protocol. Uh, the investigator may implement a deviation from or change in the protocol to eliminate an immediate hazard to trial subjects without prior RB IEC uh, approval slash favorable opinion as soon as possible the implemented deviation or change uh, the reasons for it and if appropriate the proposed protocol amendment should be submitted to the IRB slash IEC for review and approval slash favorable opinion to the sponsor for agreement and if required to the regulatory authorities so if you're doing things that are not in the approved protocol especially to immediately eliminate the hazard uh, you should follow the next steps of notifying after the fact the IRB slash IEC, uh, notifying the sponsor and press appropriate the regulatory authorities. So the next section is on the investigational product and it's gonna be the final section for this video. Uh, so in this uh, part, it says responsibility for the investigational product accountability at the trial sites rests with the investigator slash institution. Uh, so this is something key to know. Uh, who do, Who's responsible for IP accountability? I know a lot of CRAs out there actually go and do IP accountability as part of our job, uh, but ultimately there are responsibilities with the investigator for the regulations. So keep that in mind. Uh, that could be a question being asked. So the investigator institution and or a pharmacist should maintain records of the product's delivery to the trial site, the inventory at the site, the use of each subject, and the return to the sponsor or alternative disposition of unused products. These records should include dates, quantities, batch slash serial numbers, expiration dates, and the unique code numbers assigned to the investigational products and trial subjects. So those are uh, just important things to know, the dates, quantities, batch slash serial number, expiration dates. Uh, these are the, the type of things that should be accounted for. Uh, so the investigational product should be stored as specified by the sponsor and the investiga uh, investigator should ensure that the investigational products are used only in accordance with the protocol and the investigator or a person designated by the investigator slash institution should explain the correct use of the investigational product to each subject and to check at intervals appropriate for a trial that each subject is following the instructions properly. So this is where um, a lot of trials have built in what the uh, percentage of compliance is, like how many times is the subject not doing what they're supposed to do? Because think about it, the amount uh, on a pharmaceutical trial, if you're given pills and you're not taking pills half the time, this really could affect the data. So you want to make sure that you're accounting for uh, subject compliance. So this is uh, where I'm going to stop. I don't want to go too uh, in-depth and make this video too long, but these are all really key concepts. And as I continue here into the next sections and in the next video, uh, we're going to keep on building. And if you're going to spend a lot of time on two sections of ICH, E6, R2, and really you should spend time on the whole document, but section four and section five, I would read uh, repeatedly. All right, um, I think that brings me to the conclusion of this video. I hope you've enjoyed watching it. I hope you've learned something. Uh, if you haven't done so already, just a quick reminder, smash that like button and I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.